So yeah, my, my name is uh, Sergei Sosin. And uh, before starting the talk itself, I'd like to talk uh, like a little about, uh, about uh, who I am and uh, how this talk came to be in the first place. Uh, so for about a year, I've been writing a book called Algorithms for Modern Hardware. Oh, I have my camera working on. Um, it's freely available online. And as you can guess from the title um, and the fact that I'm speaking at a performance engineering conference, it is about optimizing software more precisely about algorithmic optimizations and using uh, the many intricate capabilities of modern CPUs. Um, in the process of doing my research for this book, I uh, um, looked at a lot of fundamental algorithms, the ones that normal people usually just don't look at all, uh, some for pedagogical reasons and some out of sheer curiosity. And surprisingly for myself, uh, I managed to advance the state of the art in uh, quite a lot of them. and this. Uh, optim these optimized algorithms employ a very wide range of different approaches, uh, which is why I had to write uh, a whole book about it. Uh, but one particular technique uh, that uh, stands out from the rest and is used very extensively in almost all of them is uh, SIMP programming, which is what this talk will be about. So today I will be giving a general introduction to SIMP for people who may have never even heard about it. And then we will do a lot of case studies of uh, increasing difficulty, all of them uh, somehow focused on uh, array processing. Uh, we will speed up array sums, believe it or not, our compilers do not always properly optimize even that. Uh, then we will search uh, for a value in an array, optimize our minimum computation, that is the position of the minimum element, do array reversal, and do predicate uh, filtering. And we will achieve very sizable performance improvements in all of these problems. Uh, when compared to naive approaches and their STL implementations. There are many other cool things that can be optimized uh, in a very similar fashion, uh, but after doing a test run uh, for this talk, I realized that I'm not so good at time management as I thought I was, uh, so we will have to stop there. Um, also, just as a disclaimer, these um, speed up numbers are mostly transferable, uh, but they are uh, for a specific architecture, uh, and to a degree to a specific compiler and even its uh, version. Also, I need to kind of uh, warn you that the, some of uh, ideas for these uh, algorithms are, are very non-trivial. Uh, so especially if you are not familiar with performance engineering, so it is probably not uh, like the, the kind of talk that you can listen to in the background by browsing the internet. So I'm advising you to pay uh, a little bit of attention here, uh, in the, in, especially in the beginning. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, Consider this snippet where we create an array with 100,000 integers and then repeatedly compute its sum in a simple loop that has 100,000 iterations. If you compile it with GCC with the most aggressive level of optimization selected, it finishes in about 2.4 seconds. Um, if we add just this little line, fragment GCC target of X2, uh, and leave the rest of the program exactly the same, uh, it now works twice as fast, uh, which is quite impressive for a one line change. Uh, what happened here is we, uh, uh, this is a non-code line, uh, we provided a little bit of info about the computer with which code is supposed to be run. Specifically, we told the compiler that the target CPU supports uh, an extension to the x86 instruction set called AVX2, uh, which is one of the many so-called SIMT extensions. Uh, SIMT, in general, is an acronym for single instruction multiple data, and it is a general approach in computer engineering, where the same operation is applied to a whole block of data instead of a single scalar data point. Uh, it has been very successfully used in GPUs and other similar types of parallel hardware, where the problems that you solve are massively parallel by their nature. Uh, on modern CPUs, SIMT is represented with special white registers capable of con uh, holding um, 128, uh, 256, or 512 bits of data uh, that are called vector registers and also corresponding vector instructions that logically divide the data in registers into block of uh, 8, 16, 32, or uh, 64 bits. Uh, reinterpret uh, these blocks as numerical values. I say they can reinterpret a register that of 256 bits as eight standard 32-bit uh, integers and perform some element phase uh, operation on them. For example, sum two such uh, vector registers or multiply to uh, vector registers, uh, often using a proportional increase in performance when compared to uh, the scalar approach. So on CPUs, they started with Pentium 2 in uh, 97 uh, in the form of the MMX extension set 
uh, that uh, store data in all of the existing 64-bit uh, floating point registers. That could, for example, uh, split it into two 32-bit uh, values and apply uh, two operations on them at the cost of one. Uh, MMX stands for multimedia extensions, uh, and it was meant to speed up encoding and decoding of audio and video, which is very arithmetic intensive. Uh, over the following two decades, um, the technology and its application have significantly expanded. And now on the newest high-end Intel service, we have registers that are up to uh, 512 bits wide and uh, a very wide range of different specialized instructions for working with such vector data. Uh, Note that this is not all unique to Intel chips. AMD chips are uh, compatible with all that. Uh, also, ARM chips have their own similar extensions called uh, Neon uh, that are very similar, but we primarily focus on x86 and specifically AVX2 uh, in this talk because uh, this is what most people um, have on their machines. Uh, so in terms of hardware, SIMT is already a very well-established technology. You have it on phones, you have it on laptops, you have it on servers, although in a slightly different capacity. Uh, so. Uh, having so many synced flavors, even within x86, creates some challenges for portability. Uh, but luckily, you don't have to compile and distribute different binaries for each CPU in existence for every shippable binary that you have. You can check if a CPU supports a certain structure set during runtime. In C++, this is done uh, roughly like this. There are special um, compiler intrinsics for checking if a certain extension is supported, which returns either zero or something not zero. Uh, you can also just look uh, up the CPU model on the internet, on Wikichip, for example, or if you're running Linux, uh, for example, I'm running Linux, uh, we can uh, look at this file, plus CPU info, which tells us everything there is to know about uh, the CPU. Uh, so the number of cores, what CPU it is, uh, everything to know about cache, uh, what frequency it is running, and also a very large field called flex, which contains uh, all the extensions, uh, including SIMD extensions, that are supported by this particular uh, CPU. So here, where our CPU supports AVX2, which is uh, the latest uh, SIMD extension that it supports. Um, yeah. Uh, Conversing a program from Scala to a vector one is called vectorization, and there are many ways to do it. Uh, first, you can use uh, vector instructions directly in assembly for full control, but nobody in the world like likes uh, writing assembly, so they are also exposed as compiler intrinsics in low-level languages like C and C++. Uh, one layer of abstraction higher, there are built-in vector types and external vector libraries that abstract away a specific platform and let you say define a vector of integers or some constant link that behaves like a C array uh, that you can add together uh, with the plus uh, operator. Uh, then there are different uh, SPMD compilers uh, and uh, similar JSON tools. SPMD here stands for single program multiple data. And with this approach, you write a small program uh, called kernel uh, in either C or a C-like language. And uh, this program is supposed to be executed many times uh, independently over a wide range of indices, like in loop, but in parallel and without uh, explicitly specifying a sort of. And on the highest level, we have uh, auto vectorization, which is essentially doing nothing and relied on the compiler to vectorize the loop all by itself. This only works for the simplest loops, and it works quite unreliably, but it is still often uh, very helpful when you don't want to spend uh, too much effort on it. Uh, so if you recall our example uh, from the five minutes ago, uh, the compiler was actually able to vectorize uh, the simple addition of two ar arrays. Uh, and by default, uh, the current versions of GCC and Celang only assume that we have uh, 128 bit uh, SSE which is true for most CPUs released in this century. Uh, so it is a very good default guess, uh, but if you specify uh, uh, that the CPU supports, for example, AVX2 with a flag or a corresponding pragma, uh, the compiler can use vector register twice as large and thus make the code run twice as fast, which is exactly what happened in our example. Um, in general, I recommend always using the highest level of abstraction that still lets you do what you want without sacrificing performance. Uh, there is no right approach or a tool to use, uh, so use the one that best fits your needs. Uh, but in this talk, we will uh, need to choose one particular approach uh, because we can't cover all of them. And uh, also, except for maybe the very beginning, uh, we will be constantly doing some fairly complicated stuff. And uh, therefore, we will steal to uh, intrinsics, which gives us the required level of control. Of control. Uh, 
so to use vector intrinsics, uh, you need to include a corresponding header. There are many synth extensions, and hence there are many header. Uh, but you can include all of them with just uh, this one uh, header x86 and twin dot h. Um, and just to set this matter aside, uh, assume that in all following snippets, these four um, lines uh, precede them. Uh, the, the first to correct uh, set the correct uh, target, but essentially saying that we uh, the CPU that this code is supposed to be run on uh, supports a VX2. And we tell the compiler to use maximum level of optimization. We can also set this with uh, globally with a uh, compiler flag, flags. Uh, and the two headers include everything there is in the standard library and every uh, um, x86 intrinsic uh, in existence, just so that we don't care about the things uh, later. Uh, so let's look in, at an example of using intrinsic uh, first. Here we also add two arrays together, uh, but this time we use explicit factorization to do so. Uh, here we uh, iterate the uh, three arrays in uh, blocks of four. Uh, we're using arrays of doubles, and four doubles is uh, the just the number of doubles that fit in a single uh, two hundred and fifty-six bit register. Uh, we load two uh, four doubles from the first array. We load uh, four doubles from the second array. We add them in one go with uh, a single vector instruction. And we store the result in the well, resulting array. Uh, so th this is how you manually vectorize a loop. As you could notice, to do anything with vectors, uh, you first need to get data into vector registers, which are accessible through these uh, vector types. There are many flavors of uh, these vector types that uh, specify the size of the register, what kind of data is inside, uh, some 32-bit single float, 64-bit. Uh, a double float or some kind of uh, integer data. And this type exists uh, actually only for type checking. The actual physical registers uh, uh, used by the processor are the same, and the processor doesn't really differentiate between them. Uh, so you can freely convert between these types with, uh, say, C style casting without any uh, additional cost. Uh, it is quite tedious to type these names. Uh, so we will mostly be using this type def and um, be working only with integer uh, data and with uh, FX2, which has uh, registers of uh, with uh, 256 bits. Uh, so uh, most simple intrinsics follow a naming convention similar to um, underscore mm, some size, some action, and some type. And they could roughly correspond to a single similarly named assembly instruction. Uh, there are a lot of them, and here are some examples of what they may do. Uh, first, there are many instructions for doing element-wise operation. For example, there are many instructions for uh, doing addition. Uh, we can uh, split a vector of 128 bits into eight 16-bit uh, uh, extent-packed integers, uh, also known as short in uh, C and C++, and add them together. Uh, we can calculate some element-wise uh, trigonometric functions. For example, we can uh, calculate arc cosine for doubles and uh, floats. Uh, we can sail doubles or floats uh, to the nearest integer, for example, to convert them to an int later. Uh, we can copy uh, elements uh, from memory and broadcast them to all um, elements of a vector, uh, creating, say, uh, four or eight copies of it, which can be quite handy. Um, we can do comparisons with vectors, which produce um, vector masks containing ones and zeros for elements that match or don't match uh, with the, their counterpart in the other um, vector. Uh, we can use such masks to blend uh, two vectors, essentially selecting uh, elements from one of the two vectors, depending on the value in a mask. Uh, and uh, we can do some fun things, like we can uh, load a vector of data and permute it in an arbitrary way. Um, so I will come back to all of them uh, later. Uh, so the naming can be a bit confusing. Like I've been, I spent hundreds of hours working, uh, writing some code with intrinsics, and I still can't remember whether it is underscore uh, underscore m used for intrinsics, uh, used for vector types, or underscore m and used for types. Uh, also, even when accounting for uh, versions of an instructions uh, of an instruction with different data types and with different sizes, there are still a lot of them. Uh, so Intel created a very helpful reference uh, called Intel Intrinsics Guide. Uh, it 
um, it has a search capability. You can filter uh, by different instruction sets. You can filter by different categories. It provides you the name of the function, its signature, um, its English language description, uh, and also a pseudocode to be very explicit about what uh, this instruction does. And also it provides you timings for these instructions uh, for Intel chips. It uh, provides you latency and throughput for each uh, instruction. Also, Intel being Intel doesn't include timings for AMD CPUs, uh, but you can look timings for them in um, external instruction tables. Um, so one large disadvantage of SIMT is that you need to get data in vectors first. And sometimes the memory layout or some specifics of the problems make it quite hard. Uh, in the array addition example, and for loop visualization in general, we split the array into blocks of um, that we can process with SIM instructions and iterate over these blocks. Uh, we have actually ignored the fact that it may be that the array length is not perfectly divisible by the SIM block size. Uh, and this may be a problem. Uh, so in this case, we have two options. The first one is to part uh, all arrays with some neutral elements, um, for example, zeros. Uh, and process uh, these neutral elements anyway. Uh, and the second option is to break the loop before the last block and uh, proceed normally using the scalar code. Uh, humans usually prefer uh, the first approach because it is uh, much easier to implement. And compilers prefer the second approach because they don't really have another legal choice. They are just not allowed to mess with memory and pad uh, arrays uh, arbitrarily. So to properly uh, convert our A plus B example, uh, we need to split our computation into two parts, the vectorized part and the scalar part. And we need to very carefully perform the vectorized part, not to over chop and not to touch the memory what, that we do not own. Uh, and then we need to handle the uh, uh, remaining elements with uh, the scalar uh, procedure. Uh, this is quite tedious to keep in mind. So we will assume uh, later that everything is properly aligned. Uh, to just not um, care about uh, such minor details. Uh, but in practice, it is uh, a very important consideration, especially for people who work on uh, authorizing compilers. Um, so now that we are done with uh, all the basics and all the semantics, let's do something marginally harder than just adding two arrays together. Right? Let's calculate the total sum of an array. Uh, it is harder than element-wise addition because there is a dependency between iterations. In the scalar version, uh, the uh, accumulator variable has to be updated before the next iteration can begin, which prevents uh, vectorization. Uh, to resolve this, uh, we can logically split the array into um, eight interleaved partitions, uh, could create the eight sums independently with SIMT, and then sum up the partial sums. This is probably very not clear, so let me go and uh, explain the code. Uh, first, we create an accumulator variable that is an eight um, element vector that is initially filled with zeros that we will use to sum up each partition. Uh, this part is called uh, vertical summation. Uh, we essentially just uh, iterate over the arrays in blocks of six, and we add each blocks of, uh, sorry, eight element, uh, each block of eight elements uh, with a vector addition to this accumulator variable. Uh, and then uh, in this uh, variable, we will have eight partial uh, sums of the entire ring. And the only thing that you have to do is to combine them together and sum them up. Uh, this part is called horizontal summation. And it doesn't really matter how it is implemented because uh, it is uh, uh, executed just once. Uh, the simplest way to implement it is to just dump the entire array, uh, the, the, the entire vector into some array of eight elements and uh, sum up um, these elements uh, using a simple scalar uh, code. Uh, so. Uh, there are more efficient ways to implement this, but uh, in our case, it doesn't matter. The part that matters is the repeated part, uh, the one that we call in loop, and we can actually optimize array summation uh, further. But we need you to uh, focus on a slightly different approach here. So uh, modern CPUs are superscalar. Uh, so they don't just execute an instruction sequence one by one. Instead, they read the sequence of instructions uh, slightly ahead of time and try to schedule them in an optimal way, uh, most of the time actually executing several instructions concurrently, if that is possible. So having this in mind, uh, in general, when optimizing loops and other uh, procedures for throughput, uh, you need first to make sure that there is nothing stored in the execution. 
And then you need to remove pressure from the bottleneck, whatever it may be. Um, here we, for simplicity, look at the scalar um, uh, code uh, and uh, figure out how it works and uh, also pretend that factorization doesn't exist. Uh, so if you do that, we can um, look at this loop and notice the following. Uh, even though all operations involved in this computation have high enough throughput, we only need to load out elements and we need to add elements. Both of these operations have very high throughput. Uh, the loop itself can go faster than one iteration per CPU cycle because the next iteration of the loop depends on the previous one. So uh, we can get rid of this contention uh, by similarly splitting the array into two parts, odd and even, uh, and have two independent accumulators uh, that we use to sum um, uh, map the, these partitions and only sum up these uh, accumulators uh, at the very end. This way we can do two additions per cycle uh, because they are not uh, no longer dependent and can execute concurrently uh, and maximize, in this case, double uh, the throughput of the entire loop. Uh, we can uh, generalize this uh, to the vectorized fashion. Uh, instead of one accumulator, we can use two vector accumulators. Uh, and this version is correspondingly two times faster than the previous and also the vectorized one. Uh, well, uh, on GCC at least, uh, the new the latest LLVM versions uh, seem to be uh, able to vectorize it uh, optimally also. Um, this instruction level probabilism trick is very general and very powerful, and it will be a recurring uh, theme in this talk. Uh, so before continuing doing interesting things like that, uh, I need to teach you one uh, important concept in SIM programming. Uh, other than the need to store your data continuously and uh, process it by chunks, uh, SIM has another major downside in that there is no branching. We need to use a technique called predication to replace it. Uh, so consider this example. Uh, here we create a random array and then calculate the sum of all its elements that are under 50. If, uh, if we would do it in the most straightforward way, we would just write a simple loop and add an if inside. Uh, but we can get rid of this explicit branching by using one of these two tricks. Um, first, we can uh, multiply the values that we need to sum up by a Boolean value that uh, is equals uh, that is equal to this condition. And second, we can use a ternary uh, operator like this. Uh, this general trick, uh, notice that there are no branches, at least uh, explicit branches, uh, is called predication. Uh, in SIMT, we have to do uh, roughly the same because we don't have branches. Uh, so to do predication in SIMT, uh, we can use these two instructions. First, we can use uh, a comparison instruction in this case, this one compares uh, integers of in two vectors and returns a mask uh, filled with ones for elements that are equal and with uh, uh, filled with ones for elements uh, uh, of the first array uh, of the first vector that are greater than their counterparts of the second array and a mask of zeros otherwise. And then we can use a, a special blend instruction to pick elements from uh, one of the two arrays, depending on how the comparison went on this mask. This is essentially a way to do this ternary operator uh, in SIN. So to vectorize uh, this uh, code, uh, we need to convert all its contents, uh, constants uh, as in, into vector registers. Right? Uh, so we will create a constant of uh, 50, and we will create a constant of uh, filled with zeros. So these registers are eight copies of 50 and eight copies of zero. Uh, and then we need to proceed uh, executing this loop. We uh, load eight elements at a time. Uh, we compare them uh, uh, producing a mask uh, that lets us select elements that are greater than, uh, th that do not exceed 50. And then we use the blend instruction to perform this uh, predication using this mask and essentially replacing all elements that are greater than 50, greater or equal than 50 with zeros. And then we can add this to uh, this resultant vector that contains only the elements that, you need to, that we need to an accumulator variable, uh, which is uh, just the computation that we want. Um, this example is uh, actually still simple enough to be auto vectorized. The compiler is perfectly capable of producing these four lines on its own. So let's move to a more uh, complex one. So, here, we search for the first occurrence of a value in a random permutation. Uh, to benchmark, we use random elements of an array, 
Uh, so it's worth noting that uh, on average, we need uh, to do n half uh, comparisons instead of reading the entire array. So to vectorize our researches, uh, we need to do this. Uh, we will iterate in uh, blocks of eight, uh, as always, and we compare the current block uh, using a vectorized comparison uh, with the search value, with the needle that we're searching for. Uh, for equality, uh, producing a mask with uh, ones for elements that are equal to our value. Uh, then we need to check if this vector mask is uh, zero. If it's uh, zero, this means that there are no matches on the current sim block of uh, eight elements, and we can proceed on the next iteration comparing more elements. Uh, if it's this mask is not zero, this means that needle is somewhere within this small sim block, and uh, we can use any procedure we want to find it because the sim block is just uh, eight elements. So. Uh, we now only need to figure out a way to somehow check if a mask is zero. And we can do this with the move mask instruction. Move mask takes a vector mask, a large vector mask, and computes a small 8 bit um, mask out of it uh, that is stored in a normal uh, scalar register. Uh, we can check if this mask if is non zero uh, using normal means. And if it is, we can also use the small mask to uh, immediately get the position of the element that we need. Uh, so. In our code, we first start with broadcasting the needle, the search key, and then we load uh, on each iteration um, eight elements at a time, compare all of them with our search key, which produces a large vector mask, and then we compress this large vector mask into a small 8-bit mask for each element uh, with ones for uh, elements that are equal to our uh, search key. And then we check if this mask is zero, uh, if it's not, then uh, we can immediately return the uh, the position of the element that we are looking for, uh, because uh, the uh, this intrinsics dot in CTZ uh, calls uh, stands for uh, count training zeros. Uh, so it counts training zeros and it returns uh, essentially the uh, uh, position of the lowest set bit in a variable, in an integer variable, which in this case is equal to the first element uh, that is equal to our search key, which is uh, the just the offset that we need uh, within that symbol. So uh, by doing only that, we uh, can speed up our scalar uh, procedure by about five times, uh, which is quite impressive, but we can actually improve it further. Uh, if we look at the result assembly, Assembly, uh, the hot loop will be just for instructions. Uh, so first we load some elements from uh, the uh, from the data vector, uh, from the data array, and also do a comparison with them. This is called fused instructions uh, instruction, and it is common in x86 uh, to fuse loading of something with some simple arithmetic uh, uh, operation or a check in, in this case. Uh, this produces a vector uh, mask. We make a small 8-bit mask out of it, and then we test if this mask is uh, zero or not. And if it is uh, uh, non-zero, we need to break a little. So we only need to do this for instructions on each iteration. And this uh, can actually be simplified uh, even further. Uh, there is a special instruction for testing if the entire uh, vector is zero or not. Uh, it is essentially uh, similar to the scalar test, but it works for uh, wide vectors. Uh, so we can use uh, this to um, test if a mask is, is zero or not instead of uh, computing this 8-bit mask. Uh, and this makes our code loop a little bit shorter. Uh, this does not improve performance because uh, uh, this test instruction uh, has uh, low throughput and move mask instruction also has low throughput and they both are bottlenecks. Uh, to remove the pressure from this bottleneck, uh, we uh, can do this. We can actually group uh, neighboring iterations and combine them with the bitwise or instruction. So we will proceed, um, we will process uh, 16 elements at a time. We will load the first eight of them. Uh, we will load the second eight of them. We will compare uh, both of these halves uh, producing a mask, and then we will combine this mask with uh, a bit vice or instruction. Uh, then in this mask, if uh, some element were equal to the needle, it will be also uh, be set as one uh, in this combined mask. 
And then we can use uh, the test instruction on this combined mask to uh, check all uh, 16 elements at a time. Uh, we do this because this test instruction has uh, a low throughput, and uh, this way we improve its utilization. Uh, and uh, this improves performance. If you continue this process uh, one more time and uh, consider uh, 32 elements at a time, we can reach the uh, maximum throughput. Uh, and this implementation is uh, almost 10, uh, is about 10 times faster than the original scalar implementation, uh, which is quite cool. Um, so, our next example, uh, we need to find the index of the minimum element, also known as arg minimum. Uh, in the scalar case, we need to maintain uh, this index and do and on each uh, iteration do a comparison with the minimum element, uh, which seems quite non trivial to vectorize. Uh, but we don't know how to compute the minimum uh, because it is not simple from uh, the sum example, the array sum example, and for any other reduction uh, for that matter. We also just learned how to efficiently find for the first occurrence of an element, right? So we can actually uh, combine these two algorithms and just separately find the minimum and then find the index. Uh, separately, both these procedures work at the speed of memory. And to find the minimum, uh, we uh, first need to read the entire array. Uh, but on the second pass, we may not have to read the entire array. We, we may read just half of it. Uh, when the array is random, the position of the minimum will be uh, random too, right? Uh, and we will only have to process the uh, half the elements on average on the second pass, so the combined uh, performance will be two, about two thirds of the memory bandwidth, right? Uh, but in the worst case, when the array is decreasing, uh, the minimum will be the last element. And to find it on the second pass, we need to process the entire array. Uh, so the whole uh, procedure will work at half the speed of memory. Uh, this sort of illustrates the importance of choosing the right benchmark for your problem. Uh, to mitigate this worst case scenario, we could, for example, read the array in random order, but there is actually a way to almost completely avoid reading the array on the second pass. So the idea is to split the array into blocks of a small fixed size, compute the minimum on these blocks, and then also uh, comp compute the minimum while also maintaining the global minimum and the index of the blocks that contains this global minimum. Uh, when we are done, we come back to the minimum block and find the exact position of the minimum inside that block. So this way, we only read the entire array on the first pass, computing its minimum, uh, and reread a small block on the second. So we don't. So in, in this way, we would not sacrifice any performance. Um, so when both find and min are already implemented, the algorithm is fairly easy to implement as a higher level procedure. And this blocking idea is very general and can be applied to many two-pass algorithms, and especially those that process uh, large arrays that don't fit into cache and are bottlenecked by memory. Uh, next, we will try to reverse an array of integers. To do this, we need permutations. So uh, this intrinsics with intimidatingly long name uh, takes two vector operands. The first one is data that needs to be permitted, and the second one is a vector of integers between uh, 0 and 15 included. Uh, these integers select for each position in the output uh, which elements to pick from the data vector. And this instruction can thus be used for arbitrary permutations of this data vector. Um, our use case for this instruction is very simple. Uh, we create a permutation for reversing a vector, which is a very simple one. Uh, we just, yeah, uh, and reverse the whole array. Uh, and to reverse the whole array, we read it symmetrically from the left uh, and from the right uh, in blocks of eight elements, uh, reverse each block, uh, and then uh, write them from the opposite end, essentially swapping them. Uh, this produces a correct reverse permutation as long as the length of the array is divisible by uh, 16 or something. Um, if it's not, we need to stop one iteration early and swap the middle uh, by hand. Uh, so in our final example, uh, is a uh, filtering array. Uh, that is, we need to construct another array out of the original one uh, with the elements that satisfy a given predicate. In uh, this case, uh, a simple comparison with some constant. Uh, this is used, for example, in a quick sort to partition the array into two. Uh, the performance of the Scala version uh, var uh, varies because branch prediction success rate uh, depends on the probability of this predicate. Uh, yeah, so vectorizing uh, filtering uh, involves sampling computation. Uh, we need to use the fact that permutation instruction 
I can take arbitrary vector as its selection indices. So in our algorithm, we will calculate the predicate uh, on an eight element vector of data. Uh, just read these eight elements and compute this uh, mask corresponding to this comparison. Then we will use the move mask instruction to get a scalar eight bit mask um, out of it. And then we can use a, a pre-computed table that contains for each uh, possible eight bit mask uh, that corresponds to the way these comparisons went, a, a permutation moving the required elements to the beginning of the vector in their original order. This is essentially just what we do for filtering. Uh, and then we can use this uh, permute instruction uh, to permute uh, the values in the way that we want uh, by uh, using this uh, permutation from the lookup table. And then we can write the full permuted array uh, to the output array. Uh, and we also need to uh, maintain, uh, to carefully maintain the output uh, pointer uh, and move it by the amount that we uh, have properly written. Uh, so we can uh, use this 8-bit uh, mask, uh, mask and create the pop count on it. There is a special instruction for doing that uh, and move it uh, right by exactly that amount. So uh, in code, we first need to pre-compute these permutations. So for each possible 8-bit mask uh, corresponding uh, to the way these eight comparisons went, we need to a permutation that compresses this vector by removing the elements that we do not need. Uh, and collapses the elements that is find the predicate uh, to the beginning of uh, the vector. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, and, and then we execute the aforementioned uh, algorithm itself. So we um, load eight elements, uh, we compare them against uh, these uh, constant value, um, calculating this predicate in general. Um, then we use the move mask to make an 8-bit mask after, out of a big vector one. And then we uh, look up the needed permutation uh, for this mask in a small, in, in this pre-computed uh, lookup, ta lookup table. And uh, we perform this permutation using this uh, pre-computed uh, vector value. Uh, and this uh, essentially moves uh, all our elements uh, to the, th that we need to the left. And then we can just write them uh, in the output uh, vector. And we also need to write uh, shift our output vector, uh, output uh, pointer, uh, just by the right amount uh, of elements that we have written, which is the pop count uh, of uh, this eight bit mask. Uh, so it works uh, much, much faster than the scalar one. Uh, the uh, speed, exact speed up depends on uh, the uh, um, the predicate probability because the scalar version uh, heavily depends on it, while our uh, sim version doesn't have any branches and is uh, working deterministically. Uh, also, this algorithm is much faster on ABX512 uh, because it has a dedicated compressed instruction that does uh, exactly what we need uh, in one go without any lookup tables. Um, so uh, this is this was our final example. Uh, of course, these all can be used as building blocks in some larger software, uh, and SIM is in general is used in uh, 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 is importantly used in a lot of uh, different places. For example, it is used in uh, a lot in linear algebra. There are actually uh, separate instructions for doing uh, uh, for doing dot product, which is helpful for matrix multiplication and stuff like that. Uh, it is obviously used in some library utilities, especially those that have something to do with strings, like their comparisons or finding the length of a C string and stuff like that. Um, SIMT is uh, very successfully used in parsers. Uh, like SIMJSON is a very popular uh, um, library. Uh, parsers for JSON, CSV for uh, parsing and validating Unicode. Uh, it can be applied to sorting and other statistic algorithms. For example, the uh, last example with uh, uh, filtering. Uh, filtering is uh, the core of a quick sort algorithm and also quick select algorithm. If you can speed up filtering, you can also uh, correspondingly speed up uh, quick sort or quick select and similar things. Uh, SIMT can be also applied to wide trees, for example, for B trees uh, that can be used to speed up database indices. I actually wrote a B, an implementation of a B tree. Uh, that heavily relies on uh, SIMT for searching a value within a node that is um, almost 15 times uh, faster than uh, 
the uh, SDZ set from the SL. Um, it can be also applied to flat hash tables uh, where we uh, the hash tables that use open addressing where we jump to some position and then we need to look for a key in its vicinity. We can speed up this uh, local search in uh, using a simple instruction and uh, get a very uh, fast uh, hash table. Uh, it is. It can also obviously be used in bitmaps to speed up uh, large element-wise uh, bit operations, uh, and um, all of these can be used uh, and are very very widely used in polymer uh, databases that store their data specifically so that uh, they can be processed uh, with simple instructions for analytical purposes. Uh, if you want to learn simple programming. Well, first, uh, there is a full chapter in my book dedicated to the subject. Uh, I also highly recommend studying uh, parallel algorithms in general, because computer scientists have been thinking about parallel algorithms since the 80s, long before parallel computer series became a thing, and they have many good transferable ideas. Uh, also, CPU-based synth programming is very close to GPU computing and has many of the same limitations, so it is a great source of inspiration. Uh, and also, um, it is useful to follow experts or synth programming uh, I, I think if I had to rank researchers in this field, at least those that are publicly visible and actually publish new stuff, I would uh, put myself maybe third between Wojciech Mua and uh, Daniel Lemire, uh, just because of the sheer weight of uh, their accomplishments. Daniel Lemire, by the way, uh, was uh, speaking at this conference uh, two years ago, uh, describing um, uh, JSON parses. Uh, so also, if you want to make uh, an an impact in this field that is developed uh, something that has a very high chance of actually speeding up a major user facing application or save millions of dollars in computing costs, I would uh, recommend you to investigate AVX uh, 512 and especially uh, uh, Neon. There are a lot of low hanging fruits here. So, and yeah, uh, that's it. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I do not think I have uh, a lot of time for QA. Uh, but uh, uh, if I have, I will answer some, some questions. Uh, but those that I can ask for, feel free to reach me in any way that uh, you want. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Sergey. We actually do have questions. Mm -hmm. So, Daniel Bakhovov asked, uh, I believe recent clients should do this automatically. And by this, I believe he was referring to um, array uh, accumulation. Uh, uh, to array sum, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned yeah. that LLVM uh, optimizes uh, this ILP stuff uh, automatically. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. The, he he but, has... But, but not reliably, although uh, I might have. I see. Uh, so he has a few more questions. So given the C++ code, how and when do you decide to rewrite it with intrinsics? Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I'd say always. Uh, I, mean, um, I, I, I mainly use uh, intrinsics uh, for stuff uh, where I need absolute control, and I also use uh, built-in vector types uh, that uh, I find very nice to use, uh, but they only work for very simple uh, computations, uh, such as uh, uh, they're very handy for linear algebra, for example, where you do not need advanced uh, instructions. Uh, I have this slide with different ways you can uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I also, maybe for newer projects, I would highly recommend using the same libraries uh, that, for example, uh, Google has a, a hybrid library that abstracts away many different uh, instruction sets, uh, and using them is uh, really cool because it abstracts away the hardware. And uh, you, you can get uh, a version that works for uh, not, not just on x86 or a particular extension for it, but on a very wide a range of sim capable hardware. And uh, but these, but all these uh, libraries are kind of incomplete and a bit young. Uh, so there is also this drawback, but they are constantly improving. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I assume your implementation is based on AVX2. For your vector yeah. routines, what are the AVX uh, 512 intrinsics you miss the most? Uh, yeah, I specifically did not cover them because they are really, really complex and really, really messy. 
uh, there are a lot of instructions in uh, VX 512. Um, I, I just omitted them because my talk is already very long. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, optimization space uh, here, and hence I highly recommend you look at them. Uh, the problem is uh, they are only currently supported by Intel and only by high-end uh, server-grade um, servers of Intel. And so there is a limited scope of their applicability. But you can do a lot of interesting stuff with them. Yeah, yeah sounds great. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, one last question. Uh, so there are some um, new languages and some old languages like APL that are specifically uh, trying to focus on the array programming uh, paradigm, uh, which seems to be a perfect fit for these kind of instructions. Um, so I wonder if you um, have some preferences or ideas on what is the best way to actually take advantage of these routines. Is it still C++ or maybe some other technology or uh, language? Yeah, I, I, I am a really big fan of um array programming languages, uh, but they sort of have a limitation. Uh, I mean, in, in pretty much all of these uh, algorithms that I have described, you cannot uh, express them uh, in a meaningful way in an array programming language, because this, I mean, you have lookup tables, you have some uh, complex uh, logic regarding uh, blending and stuff, and uh, array programming languages are just not made uh, for it. But they are very expressive when your computation is indeed uh, data parallel, and uh, you can't get uh, more performance uh, from them, but you can uh, simplify uh, your data parallel code by a lot uh, with data parallel languages like uh, APL and such. Uh, yeah, but, but, but you can't really do anything complex with them, uh, unfortunately, especially if this is about uh, data structures and stuff like that, uh, where it's not just array processing. Yeah, for data structures, I definitely agree. With algorithms, I well, I've seen a lot of APL puzzlers that convinced me uh, in the opposite. Like they actually managed to implement all these lookups uh, very idiomatically. At least mm -hmm. in di dialogue, they do have ways to do uh, compression and all these kind of things in a very idiomatic way. But for data structures, oh yeah, definitely not, not probably not a great fit. And last question: um, a lot of these. Uh, uh, processing uh, paradigms, they heavily depend on uh, mathematical properties that these operators have with regards to the data types. For example, associative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, and unfortunately, none of the languages I know of have a way to encode um, this knowledge. And in fact, for example, floating point numbers. So yesterday I was actually uh, giving a talk and I specifically mentioned, for example, in that in JavaScript, floating point numbers are not associative with respect to addition. So you uh, get it, different results. It is true in, in, in any language, not only JavaScript, uh, but yeah. Uh, no, not in any, like for example, uh, in ETL. Uh, this is a question to compiler engineers, uh, how to encode. Uh, I, I believe there is uh, some uh, way to tag uh, like a certain computation. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, when uh, um, LLVM uh, optim optimizes some reduction, uh, it, does, it uh, does it pretty much the same way for sums and for minimums and for maximums. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is some abstraction uh, that can specify a commutativity and associativity in uh, compilers. Uh, but uh, I, what you want to do is to create like custom data types and essentially uh, add some fields uh, to, uh, to it, just, just saying the compiler that this thing is commutative. Uh, so right. basically uh, something like iterator, or like iterator traits, so like traits, right? So that's yeah, I think this is a question to uh, language designers, uh, how to kind of tag at certain data types that it is okay. Uh, to uh, permute it and uh, use it commutatively. Uh, I think compilers are in general pretty good at uh, sort of looking at the computation and uh, figure out if it can be commuted or not. And also there are compiler flags, for example, for floating point types, uh, there is a, a flag, uh, yeah, yeah, this one, uh, that uh, sort of enables commutativity, which is not strictly correct. 
Yeah, I'm not worried too much about compilers. They definitely know their stuff, although they do have to rely on, on a lot of heuristics to handle these kind of things properly. But I was just curious, like, what do you do in practice to make sure, because like, for example, in STD library, what they essentially use is that there is a accumulate and there is a yeah. new alternative, which is reduce, which actually assumes that the operator is gonna be associative, but yeah, yeah. accumulate doesn't assume that. So I wonder if you like what kind of tricks you use when you design your API so that uh, your clients can take advantage of it. Well, uh, it, it, it's fine. It's funny that you mention uh, reduce because uh, uh, if you actually benchmark it, uh, then it is for some reason uh, slower that accumulate. I, I guess reduce uses some uh, smart way to uh, uh, overly smart way to compute this uh, sum, and it ends up being even slower than accumulate that just does it from uh, left to right, and the compiler can't factorize it, so reduce is like painfully slow for some reason. I, I don't know who uses reduce. Uh, but, uh, you know, in general for designing APIs, I, I really do not know a good answer to that. I, I think all the current factorization libraries and uh, APIs do not handle that, um, that stuff too well. Um, yeah, I, 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 I personally just use intrinsics for everything and work at the very low level. Uh, use, I mean, writing a proper SIMD library that does vectorization and uh, works with custom types it seems very very hard and i have not seen anybody successfully solve that but there are a lot of people trying like the developers of these uh, vectorized libraries they want uh, it to work with uh, custom c++ operations uh, and it's uh, i think some work needs to be done on the boundary between uh, compilers uh, uh, languages and uh, library writers uh, that hasn't been done yet uh, and yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. We are, we can actually probably continue this discussion with Nadav Rotem, who is the director at uh, Meta. He 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 has done a lot of work on compilers, so we can probably even talk about that as well during our uh, panel. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. It's been uh, very very uh, insightful and uh, useful. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much.